before I forget this time and connect to Facebook. Great. Uh, well, welcome everyone, or welcome back to the uh, virtual charrette for the Datura and Avernia Streetscape Improvement Project. Uh, this is our day four virtual open house or work in progress presentation uh, for this project. Uh, my name is Brad Davis with Alta Planning and Design. Uh, I've been leading our design team, working collaboratively with the the city of, of West Palm Beach to develop a future vision for both short and long-term improvements that could happen along Datura and Avernia Street. So welcome again. Uh, I also want to say, you know, before we get into this presentation that, um, you know, we are cognizant of the events happening uh, locally and around the country uh, as a design team. Uh, we talked with city staff and decided at the beginning of this week that we would still keep our um, public meeting commitments uh, for these presentations, but recognize that a lot of uh, people for either those reasons or for uh, other reasons have just uh, not had the time to uh, participate. And so we are going to be working with the city for uh, opportunities to create additional um, ways to provide input about the concepts that we've developed this week. Today we're just going to review the overview uh, and purpose of the project and then we're going to get into the concepts that we developed this week as a design team. So what is the Datura and Avernia Streetscape project? This is a city of West Palm Beach project uh, led by the community, you, with support by the design team, uh, us at Alta Planning and Design, as well as uh, Ecosistema Urbanum. So what is the scope of the project? It's really everything within the public right-of-way along Datura and Avernia Street. Uh, that includes not only the street uh, space itself, but we've also been exploring opportunities for vertical elements, uh, architectural elements, such as along um, you know, the, the public parking garage on Avernia. In terms of the extent of the project, the specific scope and designs we'll, we are developing are for Avernia Street and Datura Street between Quadrille and Flagler. But we're also focused more broadly about how these streets interact with the larger uh, downtown you know, street network and context in downtown connections to Fern Street, to uh, the Brightline Station, to Clematis, to the waterfront uh, relationship with the alleyways uh, within the study area. We, we've been thinking about how all of those pieces fit together. Why is this a project? Well, um, uh, many of you may have been involved with the development of the downtown mobility plan. It was adopted back in 2018 and it identified a series of projects, policies, and programs that when implemented will help achieve some of these goals on the right hand uh, side of this slide and trying to accrue the positive benefits um, and quality of life improvements that these investments can um, bring. One of those projects that was identified is the Datura and Avernia project. Uh, it was identified as a shared street project, but really no defined uh, or specific scope. And so that's the focus of this project is to define the design and um, function for the street 
uh, that will be developed um, further. It's also the result of other ongoing planning efforts, such as the Open Shore Project that reimagined the waterfront in downtown, as well as some of the other things downtown, like the Banyan um, Public Garage and some of the alleyways. And Ecosistema Urbano led that project, and we're connecting the transportation and urban design components of these different projects together. Uh, the city also developed a public realm action plan that looked at ways to improve public space and public life uh, in downtown in particular. And we're integrating some of those things um, and recommendations into this project as well. And the outcome of some of those planning efforts are things like the recently completed Clematis streetscape and the Rosemary Avenue streetscape. In terms of project schedule, we are in the concept development phase. Uh, we've done some existing conditions analysis this spring, um, spent a lot of time this week in particular developing concepts. Uh, after this week, we'll look for additional opportunities for input as we develop and refine the concepts to create a draft plan. Um, and we'll work in concert with the community to get feedback and um, generate additional ideas. Lastly, I just want to mention for people that might be joining for the first time, all of the information from this week, as well as ongoing efforts with this project, will be posted at the project's website, reimagininggdaturaandavernia.com. And lastly, I just wanted to review what we've done this week. We started on Monday. Um, we had a series of public-facing virtual sessions. Uh, the virtual open studios were meant for you all to see um, how us as a design team were working and developing these concepts. Uh, we also had more targeted meetings with specific stakeholder groups, um, folks from the business community, some of the neighborhood representatives, uh, as well as meetings with some of the departments and agencies that might be involved with implementation. We also presented each day from 5 to 6 p.m. our work in progress uh, to give um, uh, you all an idea of how ideas are developing from day to day. And we're concluding this week uh, with this presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Britt. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is Britt Stork. I'm Britt Stork from Alta. Um, I'm going to, before we jump into the, some of the design concepts, we just want to do a real quick recap on some of the engagement that we've been through this week. Um, we've had 113 surveys so far on, with the online survey. Um, there'll be more opportunity for that probably next week. Um, so these are just some of the results from those surveys. You know, we, we asked what people's connection are to, to the area. Most live um, here in West Palm um, and work downtown. So. Um, Next slide. Uh, where, where folks live, um, vast majority live in downtown, but you know there are folks on the periphery. This is sort of the, the spread of that. And then there's, there's also a, a, almost a quarter of folks living outside of the city. Um, vast majority of, of folks that responded were um, between the ages of 19 and 65, pretty broad category there, but we did want to capture that. Um, and then uh, this is one that we do enjoy seeing is just that there's been quite a bit of active engagement in all the different studies and planning projects um, within this realm. So folks are familiar uh, with the work that's previously been done and, and it's our job to kind of tie them together. Um, these are the two blocks. We just wanted to get a, a picture of, you know, where folks have more of an interest in investing in. Um, there could be a number of reasons for this, but, um, you know, you can see here that Vernia, there's a little bit more interest and then we've broken it down by block here. Uh, so it's sort of scattered about, but um, at the end of the day, they're, they're both pretty equal with a little bit more of a lean on, on Vernia. So these are our five themes and I'll talk about these in just a moment, but we wanted to get an idea from folks, you know, when you, when you are upgrading a streetscape or designing a streetscape for more micro for, for more mobility and diversity there's a number of things that can weigh in on that and um, it was just interesting to see these results here about 26 percent of folks you know wanted these streets to have an increase in mobility and access 
Um, but there was also a, a significant interest in folks, 30% to be exact, in making these streets more green, um, you know, responding to some of the climate controls. And Florida is a very hot, has a very hot summer climate and um, you know, things like shade and different, different options to cool, to be, to be comfortable and cool during summer were important. We also heard from stakeholders. We had, uh, as Brad mentioned, we had a, a couple of days where we, where we just spoke individually in small groups with business owners. Um, and you know, these results are, are to be expected. Uh, a lot of the, the people that own businesses along these two streets want more, more walkable streets. They want places where their staff can, can um, take breaks and spend time. You know, activation is really gonna help the, the service industry, especially, and um, some interesting feedback just about construction and understanding what those impacts are. You know, this is not the first time that West Palm has had these types of streets and looked at these types of transformations. So that's very helpful for this project, but it's good to get that reinforcement. Um, we also talked to residents and, um, you know, there was a lot of desire to have more, again, more walkable streets, more places for shade. And, you know, Donnie and our other design team members will talk a little bit about how some of this park space is getting activated, specifically Post Park. You know, having um, flexible space and, you know, maybe short-term solutions or temporary solutions as well as long-term solutions. And I, I thought this one was particularly interesting, put, put more emphasis on daily life. You know, let's definitely accommodate, have, a, have our streets accommodate events, but those are happening less frequently across the year. You know, what about the day-to-day? And again, the, you know, so the one-way conversion, we'll, we'll jump into the, more of those design details later, but um, there's some interest there. And, um, you know, again, having, having sort of precedent locally is, is very helpful. So this is just sort of the recap yesterday. We really dove into some of the project elements and talked specifically within the streetscapes, the two streets, what those elements look like, what um, the purposes of those are, these are just the five themes that our design team has used to sort of guide our concepts and, and help drive some of the design. They're also tied back to the surveys we just mentioned. So um, just wanted to, to recap on that. Um, all the alternatives that we'll, we'll discuss this evening sort of range in their complexity. So this, this, this slide just sort of talks about or describes how, um, how they compare and each scenario that we go through here in just a moment, we'll break it out again and, and further explain sort of elementally how the degree of change can be felt. But, you know, basically scenario one is sort of the, um, has the, the least amount of intervention and change. And then scenario three really explores more of a, a you know, a more intensive intervention, if you will. Um, and as well as that, you can see on these diagrams are sort of a, a of sacrifice between you know how much space we're providing for for vehicles and then how much space we're providing for people um, you know different the different interventions also require different changes you know moving curbs um, changes to some of the traffic circulation so again we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper into that with each of, the, of our scenarios but we wanted to show everybody sort of um, what that spectrum looked like so with that let's get into it start talking about some of these concepts great Thank you, Britt. All right, so this is talking about um, our first scenario, which is looking at Detura and Avernia. Uh, kept as a two-way street, but kept um, the curb line also intact for the most part. Very minimal changes to the actual streetscape structure would happen with this scenario. As you can see, largely it would uh, the amount of space for pedestrians would remain the same, although uh, the landscape and shade aspects would be increased, as well as flexible space that can also be pedestrian space, but per perhaps used for other things such as art sculptures, um, cafe seating, and again, landscape and shade. Uh, the trade-off, though, with increasing the amount of space that you would have there uh, would be to reduce some of the on-street parking in this situation. So we are not moving the curbs that allows us to just essentially be utilizing parking spaces to increase the space um, with this scenario as well as reducing the size of traveling so we'll get a little bit into that as we go along next slide please 
So this is showing um, an overview of Datura as proposed with this concept. Um, maybe a little bit zoomed out to see, but the idea is that the pink is pedestrian zones, and that's based off of both the existing and with additional zones that can be added to that. Um, and then the orange kind of shows where, where those collide, where the perhaps parking spaces would be substituted for more active spaces that can be flexible and can be used for whatever the community needs directly adjacent to uh, the streetscape. You can also see that there is landscape uh, dispersed in between to keep the shade and cooling effect of the street and that generally it has a rhythm to it. Um, you it might be very hard to see, but the gray areas um, generally seen on this street on the south side of the streetscape are where parking would be suggested to remain. And again, the difference between the parking that can remain versus adapted to more pedestrian friendly uses is totally up in the air and and uh, with community support can be decided upon. But in this scenario, we decided to look at it with keeping parking in some areas that make a lot of sense and um, reducing it in areas where you really want to engage pedestrians in the public right away more so than now. Uh, next slide, please. Again, Avernia also has this rhythm that we've been looking at with this scenario, showing a little bit of parking on the first uh, two westernmost blocks and, and then subtly getting into different changes of how you can use that flex zone space and really engage um, the land uses around it. Those larger order, orange blocks are showing the existing uses that really correlate to um, and correspond with seeing more changes in active pedestrian zones. So perhaps more cafe seating next to the brewery um, and next to the mixed use building between Quadrille and Dixie. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about the benefits, there are definitely benefits and definitely trade-offs uh, to this scenario and decided to group them into three different categories. Um, Short-term implementation really re uh, refers to the ability to make these changes happen quickly and perhaps in a temporary fashion. And this is great because it can be built upon. Um, of all the scenarios, you know, not changing curve lines and pretty much sticking to the existing streetscape uh, will really allow you to have that ability to, to grow over time and, and have a starting point um, to start with. And the cost can be relatively low in this case, which is a huge benefit as well. Going along with that, these, the idea of perhaps temporary solutions would, is really great for flexibility and experimentation for your newly adapted uh, pedestrian zones. And this means that you can change to um, change the, the streetscape to um, what is needed over time in your community and and the uh, land uses around it um, and also what community members want to see in their streetscape and again this possibility to test out solutions is is really unique to the scenario and um and, and a really great benefit um Another great benefit that, again, can also be seen with the other scenarios is close collaboration. Um, we want to see that in every single scenario where we're working closely with the adjacent businesses and residents of the area. But for this, again, the, the temporary idea of this um, is really beneficial to uh, work quickly and closely with residents and um, business owners in the area to decide how can we make these you know, perhaps 20 by eight uh, foot wide spaces to be adapted to direct use of the businesses and residents. Um, so some great benefits there. Next slide, please. And then the trade-offs that go with this, um, again, three categories, just kind of summing it up. We have the limitation that it, um, that again, not moving the the curb lines and in changing the existing streetscape too much um, allows for. It means that you can't realign the road and it means you have to sacrifice, you know, which area of the road are we going to focus on more perhaps. 
Um, and so with that, in not having a, a large amount of space, perhaps on one side of the road, um, it means maybe you can't do as much as what you would want to with the other scenarios. So an example of this is trees. Um, we can definitely put trees in this scenario and they can be a great addition, but perhaps they're not going to get to the, the size that you would with the other scenarios where you have a lot of root space for those trees to grow big and create a, the maximum amount of shade as possible. Um, the other trade-off is that vehicles will continue to dominate the space in this scenario. Um, that is largely dependent upon how much parking spaces are left. Um, but that can that can be adjusted and it can perhaps not feel as much of a car centric area. Um, but uh, yeah, so the next one, sec success is dependent on external factors. So that is getting at the idea that we were talking about with close collaboration in that really the success is dependent upon that close collaboration. You really need to um, be in collaboration with the businesses and residents of the area to make sure that these these spaces are transformed into something that's actually wanted and needed by the people around it. Um, so that's working with you know the the residents and the businesses of abutting buildings and also just making sure that like what we're doing with this project um, we're we're reaching out and um, making sure that everybody stays engaged and follows the process as much as possible. Um, that also is looking at perhaps the idea of reprogramming public spaces that already exist, such as Post Park and Meyer Amphitheater. Next slide, please. So getting back to the larger concepts of um, this scenario, there's uh, three is a great number, right? <laughs> so um, we have three main concepts for, um, for looking at this scenario, and that includes experimentation, flexibility, like we talked about, and enhancement of just the general streetscape. The whole idea is about. <laughs> Next slide, please. So this is a really great example of that, the temporality um, that was discussed in the benefits and how you can really test out spaces to see how they can be perceived by community members and how they'll work. Um, this is an example, there's a couple examples here. One on the left is showing Times Square in New York and how there was a, this massive arterial road running straight through it. And um, at one point there was discussion about, okay, what would it be like if we were to shut this road off and make it a pedestrian space? What would happen? and how would people use it? This photo isn't showing the interim um, of this permanent on the right versus the left, um, but essentially people came out into the road and brought their lawn chairs and claimed the space for however long they wanted to be there. And that was a great experiment that happened um, to show that people would really use the space. And um, so on the right, showing a more permanent solution, they shut down the road and um, there really are a lot of benefits that they can see from having done this. And that all is because of um, uh, testing out the possibilities. So on the right here, you can also see um, Lawn on D in Boston, a similar idea where it was a, um, a space that wasn't really used, um, especially not used by the community. It was in a very industrial space and um, they decided to go in and see what it would be like to put these temporary structures in this park-like atmosphere and really bring people to the space. And it worked. <laughs> it is one of the most well-known spots in Boston now. And what's actually happened is that these swings are now pretty permanent and there is a continuous programming of the space as a park. So those are great ways that you can see if the space um, can be used for what, what you are looking for. <laughs> So here um, we're looking at the idea of parklets and this is um, a snippet of the concepts, concepts that we've been working on from Kudril to Dixie on Avernia. And um, you can see that there are some spaces in orange that show where we've allotted space for parklets. Um, again, parking has been kept on the north side and the southern side has been opened up to the opportunity for flexible space. So, Whenever you see parklets on these concepts, 
it's really the idea of a lot of possibilities that can be done there. Next slide, please. And this is just a few examples that you uh, can see with parklets. You can make them into really interesting seating. Um, you can make them into cafe spaces. You can even extend the sidewalk into the, the parking space is essentially what you're doing here. You're using that eight feet of width that you would normally get from a parking space and transforming it into whatever uses could, be, could best accommodate the area. Next slide, please. And this is even grander than a, a parklet. Um, you can see that there, these are more, um, are truly temporary structures that can be moved around, they're movable, um, and can be interacted with in different ways. You can see that some of them are more art structure-like, um, or perhaps tiny cafes, but there are really a lot of, of opportunities that can be had for just using this small parking space. Next slide, please. And here's something that's really interesting uh, about the interaction with perhaps new businesses in the area and how you can use that zone, that um, parklet flexible zone to bring in businesses that wouldn't otherwise have an abutting building to it. Um, the idea of bringing carts and um, perhaps food trucks, but perhaps something that just fits the area to the best way that can be done. Next slide, please. And this is an example of um, that corridor we were just looking at, the, the, the block uh, between Quadrill and Dixie on Avernia, and what that could look like, all of the different possibilities of these movable seating structures, um, bringing in food kiosks to, this, to the space. And if you see close enough, there is still parking on the northern side. So it's possible to really get a good balance of both parking and these new spaces incorporated in whatever way works best. Next slide, please. So similar to the idea of parklets, um, movable and temporary elements are, are really interesting to think about. Um, this block is pretty similar to the one we were just looking at, except this is on Datura from Quadrille to Dixie. And you can see the parking has been left on the southern side and parklets are on the north, suggested on the northern side. Um, and you can also see that some of these, these crossings that we'll talk about later are in the concepts, but um, we'll get to that <laughs> later on. Next slide, please. So again, with the parklets and flexible spaces, um, just more ideas for different elements that you can include in them. Um, they don't have to be semi-permanent structures that um, are constantly containing seating or constantly containing whatever intervention you use there. They can be picked up and moved and um, perhaps moved for the day. Uh, we have a place in Atlanta that does that. Um, it is a uh, essentially a park space where they, they pick up the chairs every day. And so it really can change um, the activities that go on. It just needs to be programmed in such a way. Next slide, please. So where that so shows seating, this shows a little bit more of permanent seating um, with iconic street furniture. Um, so this slide shows some really interesting elements that you can add in a more permanent or semi-permanent permanent way that can also be seen as an artistic piece. Next slide, please. And an example of these, again, the temporary elements, the artistic elements can be seen with um, this image here, again, of Quadrile to Dixie on um, Datura. And there's just so many different options. You know, it's, it's hard to capture in one image, but uh, the idea that you can really make these small spaces, whatever you want them to be, it's what we're trying to portray is possible. Next slide, please. So color is important um, and there's so much you can do with it. There's so much you can do with murals and um, implementing color in so many different ways. The image on the right, the bottom right, shows color extending from the pavement all the way up into the buildings. You know, sky's the limit when it comes to artistic talent and murals and color. And, um, and they can be relatively inexpensive costs and they can be changeable. 
there's just a lot of different um, avenues to take with it. Next slide, please. So an, an example of where we're suggesting these major color movements is on a vernier from Dixie to Olive. Uh, there's a large parking structure there, which is a blank slate for and like a canvas uh, for artists, and it could be anyway. Um, so here you can see there's a lot of different parklets that we're suggesting and a large painted crossing um, as well. So that can also be tied from the building to the crossing and in a, in a really interesting way that's engaging to everyone there. It could be a, an attraction in some ways. Next slide, please. So here's an image showing just the idea of that, um, really tying in all the elements around you to really want to bring you to the, the space and activate it. Next slide, please. So the last slide here is showing just different treatments that can be used um, in a way of um, making the street more friendly to pedestrians crossing it and really tie in both sides of the street together. This is showing um, a picture in West Palm Beach showing a raised intersection, which is a really great way to make the intersection feel safer for pedestrians, to slow cars down a little bit, um, and to also help with drainage issues in some cases. And um, the other two images are showing raised crosswalks. So where those painted blue patches on those concepts were showing crosswalks, um, they can be painted, they can be raised, they can be made more interesting to the eyes so that pedestrians um, will be more seen in their zones. And, and again, really bring together both sides of the street in a scenario where, again, the curbs cannot be moved. Next slide. All right, thank you. All right, I'll keep it moving along. Thanks, Chloe. Um, I'll be talking about the two-way shared street. And uh, a lot of the ideas that Chloe introduced are kind of temporary versions of what this option is looking at in a more permanent way. Um, so this is looking at uh, a little more, a lot more sidewalk space than a temporary installation might provide, and a little uh, less on-street parking, inc greatly increased landscape and shade potential. Um, a slightly reduced amount of vehicular travel lanes um, and kind of the biggest win is uh, flexible space. So this is space that could be used for parking, sometimes loading zones, or this could also be designated for outdoor seating. Um, so at the heart of this concept uh, is uh, moving away from the existing curb lines and looking at a curbless street uh, or a shared street concept. Uh, which would be one in which uh, road, uh, the travel lanes are narrowed and cyclists can move in the travel lane. And in general, speeds of traffic are greatly, greatly reduced, making it a much more uh, inviting place for pedestrians to travel up and down the street. Next slide. Um, so a couple of the highlights. Um, shared streets are places for people at their heart. They create streets it's that can potentially be closed for special events. Um, they remove the street as a barrier to accessing places. With these slow streets, they're a lot easier to cross. You don't necessarily need designated crossings at uh, along the street for people to be able to safely cross. Um, they are beautiful designs in themselves and they create vibrant places from building face to building face that really invite people in and spur economic development. Uh, they're also flexible streets by being curbless uh, and being uh, generally um, flat. Uh, they're easily rearranged. They're easily closed off um, for different kinds of events. Um, and then kind of the last and possibly the biggest benefit is that they're calm and cool streets. So again, they really encourage slow traffic speeds, invite people to walk through, bike through. Uh, they increase the space for pedestrians of all ages and abilities. So uh, two wheelchairs can pass easily on a sidewalk um, so that uh, you don't have to pit bicyclists and pedestrians against each other uh, for the same limited space. And they provide extensive space for street trees, green walls, and stormwater plantings, all of which uh, contribute to the environment and to the cooling of these street environments. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, next slide. Um, the trade-offs, uh, vehicles, um, we'll see a reduction in the ease of mo motor vehicular access to certain destinations along the street. Uh, there's a little bit less space for on-street parking, as I mentioned before, and uh, there could be potential conflicts as to who has the right-of-way. Um, these are newer street concepts, and they require a bit of a learning curve to them. Uh, and lastly is, is people, is really focused on community support. This is a, a big idea to really drastically reimagine re what these streets are and could be. And they require a lot of support and buy-in from the surrounding community, including business owners and residents. Um, like I mentioned before, there's a bit of a learning curve, a bit of education that comes with a new street like this, um, like Clematis or Rosemary. Um, and uh, the, there are additional challenges to maintenance um, that may be addressed uh, given the street reconfiguration. It'd be different uh, from how maintenance would approach a curb street like what is currently there. Next slide. Um, so uh, in addition to looking kind of block by block, I wanted to present this concept um, thematically from east to west. And the reason being is we really see uh, these different blocks from east to west that are having very different elements in them that can be applied in the share street model. And the share street model uh, gives us a lot of flexibility to reconfigure uh, where curbs are, where uh, vehicular lanes are. So by looking at the context of these unique blocks, it presents an opportunity to create very unique environments on each blocks that all stitch together in a meaningful way. Next slide. So along Daytura, um, just the, the color coding, you might see uh, the, the pink on the diagram really integrates uh, spaces for people, uh, whether it's parklets, permanent parklets, uh, plaza spaces, or flexible zones that could be used for all sorts of different things. Um, the green generally indicates uh, trees and vegetation, but um, we can also think of green space as a trade-off. You want more parking, you might have a little less green space. You want more green space, you might have a little less parking. In general, we want to marry the two in a way so that we have uh, green space and parking occupying a lot of the same spaces. So uh, increase the, the beauty and the cooling of the street, but also maintain some of the existing function that's already there. Uh, in general, if we're looking from the left to the right side, and this is also true for Ivernia, um, the, the blocks on the left side uh, tend to be larger residential developments. The blocks in the middle are a blend of commercial residential, office, restaurants, um, and surface parking lots. And then the, the blocks closest to the water tend to be open spaces, parks, and some, some more destination restaurants. So if we think about these in the idea of live, active, and play, we begin to see three different identities that might emerge on the streets. Next, block, uh, next slide. Averni has a similar idea. Next slide. Uh, a similar uh, breakup of space. Um, a similar idea of live, active, and play. Next slide. So I'll start off with Narcissa de Flegler. And these ones I'm calling pedestrian streets. So on both Detura and Avernia, we see a real option to potentially have the block from Flegler to Narcissus be a pedestrian street. This would mean generally it's closed to through traffic for vehicles other than maybe loading and delivery of vehicles. Uh, the reason for it is these are going to be the highest density with out-of-towner visitors as well as kind of the destination places for people who live in the area. And there's two ways to think of pedestrian streets. One is uh, as an adaptable and flexible space that can support all sorts of different events, whether this is a street fair, art fair, concert in the street. Next slide. Uh, additional things like daily farmers markets and book fairs, things that may appeal a little bit more to the people who actually live in the area. So these are all things that require very flexible space uh, to accommodate these different uses. Next slide. And the other type of pedestrian street we can begin to introduce is the idea of a, a street that is self-programmed. It is a street that is in itself a destination and doesn't require any additional work. So one of the ways I like to think about this is a street that is more of a park, a street that is more of a place to play. A couple of examples of temporary installations of these kind of play streets. Next slide. Um, so here we're looking at Daytura, Flegler to Narcissus. Next slide. So that, that flexible street concept, one that can be reconfigured for all sorts of different things, 
very flat. The whole idea here is to not design too much. You want this to be adaptable to whomever wants to do whatever with it. Uh, so generally a flat surface, curbless, um, any kind of vertical or permanent elements shouldn't be along the edges. But in general, everything in the middle can be flexible, movable seating, uh, outdoor dining, uh, space for food carts and food trucks and the such. Next slide. And here's a, a quick look at that. Again, thinking of everything as temporary in a permanently designed flexible space. Um, so something like a shade structure, that could be permanent. It would be there uh, all the time. It would not get in the way. It would support all the activities happening underneath it. But the planters could be movable. The seating could be movable. A lot of the ideas introduced by Chloe are also applicable here in a more permanent setting. Next slide. So um, this is more of the play street concept looking at Flegler de Narcissus along Avernia. Next slide. This is the backside of the amphitheater, so it doesn't have as much natural activation as the other street does. Uh, so it's a lot more, uh, it lends itself a lot more to being a little more locally focused, focused on play, relaxation, uh, rest. So here we can really play with it. It doesn't need to be as flexible or adaptable. It doesn't even need to look like a street anymore, possibly. Um, and so we can play with landforms, shapes, uh, and different uh, permanent elements like fountains and playgrounds. Next slide. And you can see just very quick look at how much space that gives back to the people of West Palm Beach. Uh, currently, the space that's occupiable on this block is really two relatively narrow sidewalks. With fully reimagining it, you start giving uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet of cross section back to the people in different ways, and that could be programmed for all sorts of different ages. Next slide. And here's a quick imagining of that, different play elements, topography, green space. So it can serve as a green gateway from the eastern edge of the project area. Next slide. So now I'm gonna talk about from Dixie and Narcissus, and these are what I'm calling more of the active streets, your blend of building uses, uh, live, work, uh, eat. Next slide. And these would all be shared streets. So these would be open to vehicular traffic. They'd be flat. I introduced this slide during our last presentation, but I uh, just wanted to bring it back. Um, flat services, generally kind of a loose delineation between vehicular space and pedestrian space. Uh, that makes the street very flexible. Um, it can be classic paving, it can be art and, and funky designs on the ground. Next slide. But these spaces, uh, especially for these more active streets with a bunch of different uses, they can be landmark spaces with some really big, bold moves that help define what makes them great. So in addition to all the kind of more conventional streetscape elements you might see us presenting, uh, trees, landscape, uh, seating, you can think about some really big moves, some big moves that help uh, define these blocks as really kind of iconic spaces. One of the ways in which we can do this is shading, shade structures. They're big, they're overhead, they're vertical, they can be seen up and down the street. They could be seen from the waterfront, they could be seen from the train. Um, so here are a few examples of different large shade structures. Some of them could span over the space, some of them could be pops of shade uh, along the corridor. Next slide. And they don't all have to be big. Some of the shade structures can begin to favor one side versus the other. You got a sunny side, shade structure. Um, it could be more catered to seating areas, like the image on the left. It could be more art, like the image on the right. So there's a lot of different ways to conceive what shade could be. Next slide. Another key component of not just shared streets, but all streets, but the character and the sense of you get from the street is a lot more than just the elements of the streetscape. The buildings are kind of the key things that define how you feel as you are in a space. And so especially for the blocks of these corridors that have large parking garages, those tend to be cold, uh, to be next to uh, emotionally, but uh, physically very hot. Um, so some of the ways in which we can soften these facades of these underutilized building fronts, uh, green, green walls, living walls, uh, literally plants growing off of it. Next slide. And art. Art has multiple functions. One, art is beautiful to look at. It represents the community. It showcases perhaps local artists and culture. Um, but you can also think of paint as a way to make the surface less white, less reflective. It's a cooling strategy as well. 
Um, so in addition to just paint, you could explore different kind of textiles, different kind of screens to further help cool a building facade and give it a little more interest and character, character and make it more comfortable to be near. Next slide. So this is Deterra from Narcissus to Olive. Uh, next slide. And right in the middle, you have the parking garage. So here uh, we're showing a way in which that parking garage could really be transformed. The green wall, which really helps soften that facade. And then you can see across the entire space, we're looking at some kind of strung light um, structure that could go over the entire uh, street. And so this would be something that would provide a little bit of shade value, but it would also provide light value at night to really brighten it up. So thinking about those big moves that can be multifunctional for different times of the day and different users. Next slide. And a very similar idea uh, from all to Dixie. Uh, next slide. I saw in the chat someone had mentioned uh, the idea of using the facade of these parking garages to be potentially for an outdoor movie. It's a perfect use of it. These kind of adaptable facades, uh, these blank facades are very adaptable. So it could be a green wall. It could be potentially small commercial units that are put in the bottom floor of the garage. And if you were to do that, it creates a great opportunity to create outdoor seating space, really activate this for some temporary commercial uses. Next slide. And so this is looking at that. What does that big move look like? How do we treat our ceiling plane, the space above us as we walk down the street? And how are we treating those buildings so they support the uses we want to be doing in it? So here you see the green, you see the screening, you see awnings, lights overhead, and canopy. All those big moves together will begin to help make these streets feel very comfortable and fun. Next slide. And so I'm gonna close with Quadro to Dixie. And these are more of these residential streets. Um, so normally when we talk about gateways, most people would probably think about it from the water side. And the water is definitely uh, coming from Flegler's, definitely kind of your primary gateway into these blocks. But it's really important to consider the fact that Brightline Station is just on the other side of these four blocks. And so you can think of these four blocks as having kind of two entry points, two ways of looking into it. One is very active from the waterfront, and the other one is kind of visual. If you're on that train, you're looking down these blocks. Maybe you're not from around here, but maybe you want to visit. What is it about those sides of the street that make you say, that's the one place I want to go and visit via? Um, so these are looking at some very artistic uh, forms of gateways. These are very flashy. These might be better suited closer to Flagler. Next slide. But uh, gateways don't have to be big, bold art things. Gateways are just a way to indicate to somebody, possibly someone who lives there, that this is a place to start. So bike share stations uh, and bike share shelters, uh, signage, uh, advertisements for events that are going on in the area, perhaps a gateway sign over the street that is designed by the community that lives there. It's all different ideas of how to define a gateway uh, in a more residential area. Next slide. Um, so Dixie Quadro will be the last block I look at. Next slide. So here, in addition to thinking about this future mixed-use development uh, senior living facility um, along the north block, I'm really thinking about this intersection at Quadro. You see that big pink area on the left-hand side of the screen. That's the opportunity to be that eastern gateway or that western gateway, very visible from the train. Some of the things that could be in this space include transit trackers, bike share stations. Um, the tree, tree, tree lined streets, in addition, form a, a nice gateway uh, in a more residential setting. Um, and next slide. I'll pass it to the next person. Thank you. So now we're going to talk about our third scenario. Um, and uh, it's about the one-way share streets, essentially the one-way pairs between Avernia and the Jura Street. Next slide. Um, as uh, was shown in the other scenarios, there are trade-offs, benefits and trade-offs with uh, changing up the space. Um, in this case, really the, the most element that would have to be kind of uh, sacrificed, if you will, is the vehicular space. However, uh, by converting the two-way uh, uh, vehicular traffic into one-way, it allows for all the other elements to be balanced and rebalanced. On-street parking will have to be reduced. However, there are so many options 
to kind of alternate between the different uh, spaces and structures that that is definitely flex flexible and up for further refinement. Next slide. And so like the other scenarios has shown there are benefits and trade offs. Um, as I mentioned, the biggest benefit is that you gain the maximum pedestrian space, which also includes the activation that we talked about the green infrastructure that is very aesthetic, but also uh, really helps the flooding and drainage issues that the two corridors currently experience. There are already one way uh, streets uh, in this area of downtown and so they uh, blend in with the rest of the network and from even a vehicular volume perspective, uh, the, the network really between Quadrille and Flagler is not very congested. Um, in terms of trade-offs, there are definitely elements that are uh, very valid perceptions. Uh, there have been precedents of one-way streets where they have not really worked well in terms of they incur speeding and others. However, in this case, we are proposing uh, only one lane in each direction. And the, the key is to implement and integrate design elements that would really discourage speeding and promote businesses rather than um, disbenefit in any way. Next slide. And so um, this is just kind of a plain view, an overview of what Detura would generally look like. Uh, it's proposed that Detura would be the eastbound direction of the one-way pairs. As you can see here, the main goal is to maximize the green space and alternate it. And because we are able to reduce the travel way, uh, we're able to introduce a linear park on the north side of the corridor. Um, and as you move from west to east, the west side towards Quadrille is the more residential, quieter area. And then as you make your way towards Flagler is when the interaction and activity and outdoor dining uh, begin. And of course that culminates in the last block between Narcissus and Flagler, where you have a lot of green space and shade opportunity for public seating where you're able to integrate with the green space and the, the activities going on at the amphitheater, enjoy the view of the water, and then interact with the you know, iconic restaurants uh, on the water. Next slide. Similarly for Avernia, the idea was to populate the space that we have now, um, we're now rebalancing and make it interact with what's out there in terms of the uses, the offices versus the restaurants. And so in this case, you've got some uh, dining uh, places where the residences are closer to Quadrille and you allow for more spaces for more outdoor dining. And similarly in the last block between Nar Narcissus and Flagler, the idea is to maximize the pedestrian space. And of course, this would be the westbound direction for the one-way pairs. Next slide. So this is just a quick overview of generally how the network would look like. The arrows in orange are the existing two-way streets. The green arrows are the existing one-way streets. So as you can see, there's definitely precedent in this traffic network for that. Um, and the, the amount of driveways that would interrupt the overall flow of the one-way streets is really not that significant to the point of considering this option further. And we're also looking at, in a, a little more fine-grained uh, scale, for example, the Narcissus uh, intersection um, at Ivernia, you know, uh, straightening it and more making it more navigable for cars. Next slide. Taking a closer look at some of the blocks, we're kind of presenting three blocks in this case as an example. Um, yeah, this particular one is Detura from Dixie to Olive. In this case, we are transitioning into the linear park on the north side, recognizing that there is definitely office space. It's more of the financial district, if you will. And so we want to pro provide that interaction to go outdoors and have lunch during the day, um, have coffee, interact, and then move further east and have opportunities for outdoor dining and entert entertainment. Next slide. Looking on the ground of how that would look like, uh, to the left you'll see the promenade or the linear park idea where you've got the greenscape on both sides of the street, 
uh, you want to have enough traveling width for, you know, uh, flexible, easy movement for deliveries um, in, in larger cars. And um, on the south side, the pedestrian space currently is a little constricted. There is definitely an opportunity to expand it, but there's also room to keep the on-street parking with, uh, although we can make it a little more um, positive towards uh, green infrastructure, as you can see here. Next slide. This is just an example of what it could potentially look like. As you can see, we're introducing a curbless street in this situation. There are many different ways to delineate that, depending on the context. In this case, of course, you know, the, the different in the color and the context would make it clear where the different designated spaces are, but also make it very comfortable to bike, walk, um, and, and make it a safe environment. Next slide. This is another example of kind of aerial view of linear parks. The idea is really to kind of meander, walk through an area that is inherently comfortable and safe to walk through and shaded given the climate in South Florida. Next slide. Uh, second uh, block that we are uh, introducing here is uh, closer to the water, Flagler Drive, and it is on Detura uh, Street. And that's where you really want to maximize uh, the, the pedestrian space. There's so much opportunity to kind of make this, uh, make the space interact. The blue uh, circles that you see here represent proposed shade. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the different shade structures that would previously discussed our examples. Um, the, you know, in terms of vehicular movements, there are definitely a lot of opportunities to either make it more of a pedestrian plaza or still keep the vehicular way going one way, but, you know, at definitely lower speeds. Next slide. And this is kind of an example of what it could look like on the ground. This is just kind of a, you know, uh, an idea where uh, to blend in with the water environment in the beach down here. Uh, one way is to introduce kind of a same feature that integrates with the public seating and then all of the other critical uh, street elements like the bike uh, facilities and uh, technology and others. And then you see here kind of the orange and uh, the circles representing the shade structure that would complement the overall space. And again, the green elements are critical in this case, but the idea is the closer you get to the water, the more you could introduce more palm trees in integrated with the shade structures. Next slide. This is just kind of a, an example of what it could, like, it could look like in an urban slash uh, retail environment. Um, we are also cognizant of the fact that we want to plan and design for all ages, uh, children, um, all the way to uh, the senior population. Next slide. And the last block that I wanted to showcase here is uh, along Avernia Street between Quadrail and actually the couple of blocks between Quadrail and Olive. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in this case, uh, there is definitely more residential presence uh, closer to Quadrilla. However, to complement the outdoor dining, there are uh, definitely more opportunities along Avernia to introduce a, pl a plaza type feel where you could introduce public art or, um, you know, as we described before, streets that become destinations on their own. Next slide. And this is uh, the, the example of what it would look like on the ground. It would be critical to uh, make this space accommodating of people who live there, make it more comfortable, quiet and safe, but also pleasant to walk at night and dine at the restaurants outside and you know, have the adequate lighting that would combine the, you know, the required street lighting with the aesthetics, aesthetic lighting. Next slide. 
this is an example of what a temporary or a permanent shade structure could look like on a quieter street or a more uh, retail destination type street. The, a lot of these uh, proposed improvements are low cost and a lot of them could be introduced as pilot study, pilot um, improvements, and they could be rotated a lot around the year, um, depending on season or specific uh, events that are taking place. Next slide. And lastly, I do wanna emphasize that really the biggest benefit of one-way streets is that you are combining all the critical elements of a street. They can still, the function uh, in terms of the needs of um, the residents and the visitors. You could have the bike facilities um, and the, the bike share programs, bike parking. You could have safe, adequate seating, shaded structures, and also vehicular flow. And so it kind of creates that balance with uh, a lower, not as much of a burden on vehicular and traffic volume flow given the specific downtown context where, where volumes are already low. Next slide. Great, well, thank you everyone. Um, these three scenarios uh, really highlight some of the different strategies that can be implemented along Datura and Avernia Street. So in terms of next steps, we are going to be uh, working with the city to uh, get a work in progress online survey uh, out next week. And really the focus for that is to be able to give uh, you all time to review these concepts, think about them and provide your feedback in terms of which elements of each scenario do you like? Is there one particular scenario that you prefer over the others? Are there different elements of each scenario that you would like to see um, carried forward? Uh, we'd love to get that feedback um, uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll also be updating information about the project on the project website and the Facebook page, as I mentioned, uh, as we identify additional opportunities to provide feedback um, uh, about this project and the development of the concepts. Uh, we'll be working over the summer to refine these and pull together a draft plan. And like I mentioned, there'll be additional opportunities for input. Lastly, I'll say everything that was presented this week um, was uh, can be found at the Facebook page, facebook.com backslash Datura and Avernia. And all of these uh, recordings and presentations will be on the project uh, website under the virtual charrette page. So thank you everyone for your time this week or in the coming weeks. We look forward to hearing more about what you have to share and your vision for the future of Datura and Avernia Street. Thank you.